All right, today's giveaway, the flagship MAPS program. MAPS Anabolic, it's the one that started it all. Great muscle building program, great for boosting your metabolism. That program right now I'm giving away to, for free to one of you lucky viewers. All you got to do is leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode, subscribe to this channel, and turn on your notifications. If you do all those things and we like your comment and we pick it, we will notify you and get free access to MAPS Anabolic. One more thing before we get to this incredibly awesome episode that will help you figure out why your diet is failing you. We have a huge promotion that'll be ending in five days, okay? So it was a January promotion. We're not gonna do this one for a long time. It's the biggest sale we've done ever in Mind Pump history. Here's what we did. We put together three workout bundles. Each bundle is nine months of exercise programming, okay? So you get sets, reps, what exercises to do, the tempo, video demos, everything you need for nine months of incredible fitness. Now, here's how the bundles work. The first one is for beginners. The second one is for those of you that are intermediate. And the third one is for those of you that are advanced. They're also discounted over 70%. Like I said, it's a massive sale. And again, it's ending in five days. So if you're interested, head over to mapsjanuary.com. Click on the bundle that's right for you. Or you could do all three. You can go beginner to intermediate to advanced. Go there, click on it, and sign up. Also, if you just want to try one MAPS program, you want to see what all the buzz is about, you want to test it out, just do one. Do MAPS Anabolic. It's the, like I said earlier, it's the foundational program. It's the flagship program. That one by itself is 50% off for the next five days. So if you just want to do MAPS Anabolic, go to mapsred.com and then use the code January50 for that discount. All right, here comes the show. Jason, I'm glad you're here today because I want to talk about, it's January, right? Uh, or we're recording this in January. It's the beginning of the year. A lot of people starting diets, a lot of people starting to workouts. And I wanted to talk with you about kind of the main reasons why uh, people's diets fail. Um, and then at the end, I would like to for you to kind of go through and talk about, well, stuff that you see that we maybe don't talk about or sure. that we don't normally cover. Yeah. How's that sound? Absolutely. Is that man. Good? Let's do it. All right. Because you're definitely the guru on this. And I know you train a lot of coaches. Um, so um, in my experience as a trainer, one of the main things or the first things that I see when somebody's diet fail, this was a real common one was that people's, the, the weekends, they would screw up on the weekends and they would screw up so badly that it would completely ruin the, you know, Monday through Friday, right? This is a common one. I gave this as a tip not that long ago. We were talking on a podcast and I said one of the most pivotal things for my own personal journey as far as, you know, goal setting and achieving and, and chain, body transforming, right, uh, that I went through was actually simply just making never scheduling my off days or recovery days on the weekend like making sure that my diet and my training i had scheduled on the weekends and if i needed a rest day if i needed a day off of just eating whatever i wanted it had to happen during the week and just simply making that simple rule i saw a huge change and i what i attributed it to is that the weekends are so easy to sleep in and not be physical and active. Uh, people are normally watching TV and snacking or you're going out to dinners or this, these are the times when these things are more, uh, are more tempting. And the weekdays we're on our reg, you know, you get up at a certain time, you get yeah. to work and you work out and you have like a, you're, you have this tight schedule. And so, and it was like this uh, psychological game I was playing with myself. It was, I'm not telling myself I can't have pizza ever. I'm not telling myself that I can't have a day off. I'm just going to say it has to fall on the weekday. And on the weekends, I'm going to make sure that I'm active and I'm dialed. And it made a huge difference. Yeah. Can you so, explain why this happens, Jason? Because I guarantee someone's listening right now and they're going, well, how is that possible? If I'm good five days a week and I'm not good two days a week, why doesn't the five overpower the two, right? I should still see progress. Well, yeah. So first of all, I want to acknowledge what you said. I love the psychology, Adam, of like what you said, because it's really funny. I just did a, we let Instagram decide what my diet would be for a day. And somebody said, <laughs> eat nothing but Chick-fil-A. And so that's what we went with. All right. And I felt like complete shit an hour after breakfast. Yeah. What did you and, order though? We got to go through this. Oh, uh, <laughs> we went chicken minis, uh, bacon, egg and cheese biscuit, and hash browns for breakfast. Mm. So I let Instagram choose every meal. Okay, okay. Uh, How did you do it? Was it one of those games? Yeah. yeah so you know, I just did a like you know a question box, and I was yeah. like, "What what should the diet be?" And they That's said right. Chick Fil A for a day. And I was like, "All right, cool. You order breakfast." And the next one, we did a bench press challenge. Um, you know, for every rep short I was on on two twenty five bench of twenty four. That was the number my trainer set. Uh, for every rep short I was, it was two nuggets. So I only got sixteen that day. Uh, so I had sixteen nuggets and like a large fry. And then dinner, we let the cashier order. 
Uh, and wow. so they gave me a number one, which wasn't too bad. And then you felt like uh, trash. And I, and I felt like garbage all day. But I think that like the, I knew I was going to feel like shit. And so, you know, the weeks for me, Monday through Friday, I have to be on point. I'm working, I'm talking to clients, you know, uh, if, you know, for the people out there, if they're going in the office, whatever they're doing, you, you can't forcibly feel like shit. Whereas like on the weekend, if you get up and you go get a dozen donuts or, you know, you go get Chick-fil-A or whatever, like it's, it's cool. Like you feel like shit. Great. You go take a nap on the couch. You, you keep feeling like shit and you keep eating more shit. Um, you know, so I think it's really, I love that psychology. I've actually yeah. never looked at it that way, but to, to answer the question in terms of, you know, whether it's five days on or, or six days on and one day off or two days off, you know, at the end of the day, when we look at uh, calorie deficit or a calorie surplus. We're not just looking daily, we're looking weekly. Um, and so we're always looking at seven day averages. Uh, at least you should be. Uh, you know, there's so much just propaganda out there. Oh, throw away the scale. Well, first of all, I think we need to stop demonizing the scale. It is it is data. Um, it's not the only piece of data that matters, but you do need to know where you're trending. Not saying you have to trend down by any means, but you should know where you're trending. Uh, the data can actually tell us a lot of things, especially for people that are, you know, borderline uh, metabolically adapted. Sometimes you see weight go down after significant overfeedings, and that's actually good data as well. Um, so I want to get away from the notion that you you should just throw away the scale. But when we are looking at the scale, we should be looking at how are things changing over seven days? You know, water intake is going to fluctuate every day. Electrolyte intake, so sodium intake is going to fluctuate every day. You're not going to hit the exact same nutrients and you're not going to eat the exact same foods every single day. Um, so we're looking for trends. And as long as things are trending the right direction over time, that's great. But, you know, people see on by Friday morning, they're like, oh, I'm down three pounds for the week. Let's go have our cheat meal. And, and mm. I think that's also part and parcel to the industry promoting cheat meals mm -hmm. or free meals or discussing something as if it's completely contrary to your plan. I, I don't look at, you know, anything that I eat as contrary to my plan. Uh, you know, if I want to go and, you know, I live in like the DC area and I love Georgetown cupcakes. If I want a Georgetown cupcake, like that's just part of what I want to have. Like maybe I'll have one or two per week. They're only like 300 calories. It's not a big deal. I don't, I don't look at it like, oh my God, I just completely went off my plan. Um, so I think that people are like, all right, well, I did my diet. Now I'm going off my diet. And let me tell you, a reasonably set up diet should only be 500 to 700 calorie deficit at most, right? And so when you think about one cheat meal, let's just think about something simple like pizza. You're probably going over your caloric allotment by two, 3,000. Yeah. Now let's tack some alcohol on. Now mm. let's tack on, you know, whatever dessert you have. We're talking about three to 4,000 calories over what you should be in one day. And, and, and if it, you it very easily erases, well, what it's you did the, the it completely erases the other six days. If the other six days were at 500 calories, you were only in a 3000 calorie deficit for six days. It's very easy to do that. You it's know, super where, easy. You know where this all came together full circle for me was when the, the introduction of the body bug, uh, which was like, you know, basically one of those trackers, right? Yeah. So, uh, 24 hour fitness thing. Yeah. Right? It was yeah. like the, the, one of the original ones that came out and it was, it was fairly accurate to your metabolism. And what I found was exactly what you just said. Not only did I go over, because I kind of knew, obviously, if I knew if I crushed four to six pieces of pizza right. and had another, you know, fast food meal or whatever like that, I knew I was over. But what I also didn't uh, take into consideration was, oh, I slept in an hour and a half. Mm. And then the first hour of my day, I watched football. And then, you know, I so your was, was down, dude, my movement was 50% of what it was during the week. So not only did I overeat by about a thousand cal or what I thought was only overeating by about a thousand calories because I'm adding that pizza or whatever that other dinner, but I also reduced my movement. So those one or two days on the weekend, even if I was perfect Monday through Friday, training hard, consistent, perfect, never missing the diet, just that one or two days was enough to counter all that great work. Yeah. So, so just to put it plainly, uh, to lose weight, you have to consume less calories than you burn. That's what you're referring to when you talk about a 100%. calorie deficit. Yep. So, if Monday through Friday you're at a 500 calorie deficit, that's 2,500 calories of a deficit. You go into Saturday, you go into Sunday, and on both days, let's say you eat 1,500 calories over what you burn, which is really easy. It's very easy Super to do. Easy. Now you're 3,000 calories over on Saturday and Sunday, but you're at a 2,500 calorie deficit Monday through Friday. At the end of the week, you're actually 500 calories over. In a surplus. In a surplus. In other words, you're gaining weight, even though Monday through Friday, you felt like you were doing so good, and Saturday, Sunday, you felt like you just went off a little bit. It, it all breaks down. And you're way. using an extreme example, and I think what really happens where people get stuck is that it isn't that extreme, but it's enough. 
right? It's like, I, I only ate, I ate a couple slices, yeah. or, well, but then I, you also didn't move. I think in an ideal world, you're perfect Monday through Friday. But how many people are actually perfect yeah. Monday through Friday? Nobody. Right? Those bites and those licks, like they add up. As, as much as that seems like minutia, if you're quote unquote perfect Monday through Friday, we know, okay, there's probably a few liquid calories and there's probably a few extra bites of something in there. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, oh, I was perfect. Then you go into the weekend where you do go into a surplus. Yep. Now you're in a really big surplus. And you are, I mean, physiology says you should be gaining weight. It's your body's not working against you. It's not the diet that's not working. And I think that I'm actually excited to do this podcast because so many people blame the diet Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and there's so much, uh, there's so much buzz around in diet culture around how diets don't work. And mm -hmm. it's, it's really sexy to be a guru in the space right now and say, Oh, well diets don't work and you shouldn't diet. And I'm like, no, actually like assuming all things normal, like in physiology, diets do work. If you're in a calorie deficit, mm -hmm. they work very well. Uh, you just can't go out on the weekends and eat like a fucking asshole. Right. And, and to what you were saying, Adam, let's say that it's a small difference. Well now for the whole week, you're at a 100 calorie deficit. Maybe yes. now you're months into your diet and you <laughs> See, lost hardly. two pounds right. on yeah. the scale. And right. you're like, okay, this is, this just isn't worth it. All right. So this next one, I'll never forget when this really hit me. I'll never forget. So back in the day, so I'm going to date myself a little bit, but we didn't have, like, I couldn't go on the internet and look things up. We had, like, the Calorie King book or whatever, and <laughs> yeah, you had to flip calorie through. King. Yeah, and look things up or whatever. And I remember I would see, like, you know, medium banana. And I'd be like, okay, cool. I'll get a regular banana and eat that. And, you know, medium-sized apple. Oh, yeah, I'll, you know, no big deal. And then one day I said, you know, it's not really working. Like, what's going on? Like, I, I noticed my body fat isn't really changing much. And I, I looked up the weight of a medium banana. I weighed the banana that I got, and apparently I was getting these super extra large bananas <laughs> that were massive. And then I realized I was I was guessing and estimating wrong. And I know a lot of people do this. If I remember I would have clients come to me and say, oh yeah, I have a tablespoon of peanut butter. Show me what a tablespoon looks like. And it's like, no, that's it's like three, a shovel. Bro, I have, that's yeah. three tablespoons of peanut butter. I have the best story for you with it. I was, uh, I won't say who, I was working with a WWE athlete and she was preparing for the cover of the ESPN body issue where you have to be naked mm. and and i remember like we get started and i was like all right like you're tracking your food right and she's like well no i'm on the road all the time and i'm like would you take a scale and she said no and i was like okay i'm gonna send you one and so her food log that she had sent me it said like three ounces of chicken at three of the meals throughout the day and i had sent her this like pocket scale and she goes holy shit she's like i measured my food yesterday and i was like well how much were you eating nine ounces yeah. <laughs> and i was like a little bit holy shit like yeah. We're talking 18 extra ounces per day Yeah, mm -hmm. at about seven grams of protein right, per ounce of chicken. Yeah. We're talking 142 grams extra of protein, but we're also talking 18 to 20 extra grams of fat. Mm -hmm. We're literally talking 900, yeah. almost a thousand extra Instead calories. Instead of a deficit, that, she's in a surplus. Yeah, I, and I, she's wondering why she's not losing. And, you know, obviously lots of protein. She's wondering why she's bloated. And I'm like, well, here's the reason. So, I mean, it was one of the easiest switches it's mind blowing to me too how many people say, well, it's tedious. I, I mean, do you still, I, I don't weigh and measure my food that much because I've been doing it literally for years. No, I think the first, what I, this is what I used to tell clients. At first, you have to do it so you you know what your reference point is. It's a learning context. tool. It's, like, yeah, it's the educational piece. Yeah, like yes. most people have no idea when they see three ounces of chicken. If they guess what three ounces of chicken is, it's way more. And by 100%. the way, the chicken breast you get at the store are like eight ounces, nine ounces, yes. 10 ounces, you know? Well, I, re I remember, this reminds me too of a, a, another situation where I started to really piece this together. So, you know, we and this is so silly, right? We used to have this idea. This is trainers, us trainers talking. When I ate a food like a sweet potato, um, I really didn't count it, or I just low ball estimate because it it's a sweet potato. It's low glycemic. It's not very many it's calories. It's healthy. Yeah, it's healthy, yeah. right? And when I would look it up in the book, like you know, a medium sweet potato would only be like 125 calories. So I'd be like, oh, I'm not with you. I'll never forget the first time I weighed the sweet potato that I thought was a medium sweet potato, and it was literally like four of them. <laughs> <laughs> and, I had, and that's what I was eating. And then I was, and I was not counting that. It was like, I was just chalking that up as a healthy food that was probably only 100 and something calories. That was really like 600 calories that I wasn't even attributing to the diet, right? So yeah. I think that, and I know that here I, I was a trainer. I, I, I understood this stuff and I still made mistakes like that, which is why I would, I would make all my clients track at the beginning. And, and the goal I would tell them is that, listen, we, this is not, I don't want you to be tracking for the rest of your life. The goal is that you get to a place where you can eyeball a piece of chicken and get pretty close to what that is, or eyeball a sweet potato. I know because you've already weighed it four or five times before, and you've seen what a big one, a small one in the middle looks like, and you've tracked it enough times that now you have a pretty good idea when you're, when you're close there. And I think once you're there, 
I don't I don't think it's necessary to weigh it, but the beginning is I think so necessary. Yeah, when they do studies on this, there, there's many studies on this where people will estimate the caloric intake. Yep. They're like 30, 40, 50% off every single time. Now, here's what I think is interesting. If we were to make that statement today and most people hear it, the popular dietary culture is going to say they're they're underestimating because everybody wants to talk about it. everyone in the world under eats. Mm. I actually disagree. I think that ninety percent of people would overestimate, yeah. right? Yes. Like like they would be eating more than they're reporting, not eating less. Well, uh, the the fact that obesity's at where it's at would prove that you're right. Our our dietary world, like our our small little fitness world, is such a microcosm of what actually exists in Correct. the world. And mm-hmm. just because mm-hmm. in the fitness world we see such a a metabolic adaptation and phenomenon dysfunction. going on mm-hmm. right now, and a lot of HPA axis issues, we think, well, that's what's running rampant in the world. But you know, when Mrs. Jones comes to you and she's forty years old and she's a hundred pounds overweight, we we probably can't look at her yeah. and be like and make these assumptions that hey, you know what, you're you're underestimating. Yeah, and one of the things I like thinking. about you, Jason, is you you mm-hmm. you work with re- real people and right. your coaches work with real people, so that's what you're constantly communicating. Yeah, with this one, the like the guessing, I remember you know another one that screwed me up was olive oil. I know that's you know funny because I'm Italian, but mm-hmm. I, I would put For olive sure. oil on stuff and I'd calculate two tablespoons. Oh, two tablespoons of olive oil. Yeah. And then yeah. one day I actually measured it out. I'm like, dude, it's like half a cup. Like, I'm like, <laughs> like half a cup of oil. It was the same just with like eating and snacking on like peanuts yeah, nuts and walnuts. Or, nuts and will get you real quick too. So high calorie once yeah. you really start adding up each one and well, like I how think many this, consuming. This also ties back into you know quality-based diets in general. You know, I think when I first came into, when I first uh was big in like the CrossFit space, right? Mm-hmm. Back in 2012, I always said I was the most hated nutritionist in CrossFit back then. But I, you know, I used to say there was two types of paleo dieters in CrossFit. There was the kind that they they would say, well, almond butter's paleo. And they would eat the whole jar of, of almond butter. Because they're like, well, it's paleo. And paleo didn't have quantity mm-hmm. parameters, right? You could just, as long as it was paleo, you could eat as much as you wanted of it. I, I mean, listen, I understand almond butter doesn't spike your insulin very much, but if you're 100 pounds overweight and you're eating 5,000 calories a day <laughs> yeah. from almond butter, you're not losing weight, no, you're not right? Losing weight. But at the same token, you got these people that are doing insane exercise mm-hmm. and they're literally, they're like, well, you know, I'm paleo, I'm eating salmon and broccoli. And it's like, okay, now you're eating 900 calories and you're trying to train like somebody that is, you know, like you're trying to train three times a day, like somebody that's competing at the CrossFit games. That's not sufficient either. So I don't, you know, it's not even about like overestimating all the time. Sometimes it's about like Just you could guessing. be eating all the healthy foods yep. in the world, but to some degree, if we want to act with precision, whether it's, you know, performance goals, aesthetics goals, even longevity based goals, uh, we have to understand to some degree quantity. It's uh-huh. it's non-negotiable. It, it's it continues to show up in studies. Like uh, I mean, yes, the types yeah. of foods matter relative to like your insulin index and, and your, how you feel and cravings all of stuff. Course, but at but, the end of the day, if you're eating too many calories, it doesn't matter. Exactly. It just doesn't matter. Well, you talking about paleo also leads to our next point, which is about just diet culture in general, <laughs> right? And I just think that that that's where we've gone wrong. Is I mean, how many times as, as coaches and trainers have you guys got this where someone hires you and they're like, hey, my friend followed the paleo or followed the ketogenic diet and I too want to follow yeah, that. And it's like, worst. All, all diets fail. They all fail. And even when they are temporarily successful, they fail long term. I just, I, I hate this idea of trying to demonize other ways of eating and say that your way is superior than a, an, another way while you're also eliminating these foods that realistically you're going to want to have yeah, some so, time in your life and, again. And what you're referring to is just starting off completely unsustainably. Hey, I'm going to start on this health and fitness journey. I'm going to eliminate all carbohydrates or I'm going to eliminate all foods except for meat. And it's like, okay, you are not. You didn't just take a step. First of all, any step is difficult and challenging when you talk about nutrition. You, you took 15 steps. You went real extreme, and it's just not sustainable. It's an unsustainable approach. Right. Well, okay, let's let's put it in a completely different perspective. If I asked you today, like, you live a pretty good life, right? How old are you? 42. 42, right? So you live a pretty good life. You've mm-hmm. created success in your life. That that does not immediately create an assumption that you've never failed, right? Right. Like, like you've had a lot of things in your life that you've fucked up. Mm-hmm. So right out of the gate, we're, we're basically saying there's good and there's bad, there's right and there's wrong, and that your ultimate success is going to be defined by whether you only do good, but if you do bad, you're completely fucked up and, mm-hmm. and you're not going to achieve your result. Well, we can all sit in this room and we've all achieved great things in our lives, but we've all fucked up a lot. So why are we telling dieters that if they do something bad or they do something wrong, 
that that's not going to get them where they want to be. Like, I believe that whatever result you do or don't create is really just a collection of all of the things that you do. Some are going to be in line with your goals and some aren't going to be in line with your goals. And if we can start looking at a journey that is much longer in duration Mm. and we can start seeing, hey, listen, like, no, you know what? You had pizza last night. Like you went over your calories. You're probably not going to make as much progress in the next three days. Who the fuck cares about Mm -hmm. three days, right? Because if you're still going to hit your target in 16 weeks or 20 weeks or 24 weeks, why does what happens the next three days matter? And I think that, you know, we talk about keto, carnivore, whatever extreme diets we want to go on. They're all creating these labels for us that immediately set us up for failure. Right. They're, they're driving home that yeah, you failure have one car mindset. And you totally failed. You're, I'm no you're longer fucked. keto. Yeah. 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 So I think that that's from a, you know, mindset I think is the hardest thing people have when it comes to diet anyway. Totally. They, they have already conditioned themselves to the fact that they're failures when it comes to diet. Like most overweight people have attempted, I think the stat says something like four plus diets, right? And they, that means they failed four plus diets. So subconsciously, they're already labeling them themselves as a failure. And so I think if you as a coach or you as a provider go in and you allow them to now identify with all the things that they failed at before, you're actually also doing them a disservice. You're you're immediately transposing their mindset from one of optimism to one of failure. You're taking them back to a place that they have labeled in their life as failure and you're allowing them to operate from there. And I think that that is the worst thing you can do and that's that's not a knock on keto or carnivore or any of those things. I I really you know, to open up another can of worms would just say none of the diets are quote unquote bad. They're all horribly misapplied. Yeah. Like keto as a diet, there's some great benefits yeah, to go on keto. There's there's some great benefits to carb cycling. Like some of my WWE athletes that are getting ready for WrestleMania right now, they're all carb cycling because guess what? They got to look really good on TV mm-hmm. twice a week. And but they also still got to be losing body fat, right? When I train an MMA fighter for a fight, they still have to perform during camp mm-hmm. and and but they still need to be losing weight. And the fastest way to do that is a carb cycle. So there's no bad diets, but there's horrible application. And application, as we know, is what achieves success. Well, especially when you're talking about the general population, right? When you talk about very specific condi- uh, conditions, right? There's obviously diets that, that make sense. But I, I think we try to tend the, or steer the conversation towards the general population that make the mistake of following these diets that are sp- mainly for more specific people, I think, that where, they, where the application is, is it's better. It's just totally unsustainable. It's an unsustainable way to start. And so, like you said, Jason, you're setting yourself up for a near future failure, almost guaranteed. It's really funny because, I mean, what we're, we're three things in, seven, seven reasons people are failing. And I think so much of this has... Obviously, the dieter has to take some responsibility. At the end of the day, like you overconsume food, that's on you. You undertake a diet actively, and mm-hmm. that's on you. But look what we as an industry are doing. Like, like you know, we're when we talk about eating whatever you want on Saturday and Sunday. Well, how's that been labeled? Cheat yeah. meals. Yeah. I mean, dude, go all the way back to I'm going to date myself. Bill Phillips, Body oh, yeah. for Life, right? What was Body for Life predicated on? You know, it was one massive EAS sales pitch, <laughs> but it was like six days of dieting and then your seventh day free you know, go all the way back to the days of like Scott Abel and and he had his cycle diet and that was a big proponent for him. You know, six days on your diet and seventh day, eat whatever the hell you want. Um, you know, here we are creating diets, putting labels on them. And, and to be fair, I understand the marketing side of this. We've done a podcast on the marketing of fitness. It's not sexy to go to an overweight person and say, well, oh, just make some sustainable changes. Uh, <laughs> like mm-hmm. they're like, what do you mean? That would, that would that never doesn't work. sell products. No, that doesn't sell product. That also doesn't create excitement. It doesn't necessarily mm-hmm. create that initial change to get somebody moving forward, which is really what we have to capture. And I think that I think the best coaches in the world are the ones that can find that find that middle ground. How do you get somebody really excited about moving forward? But how do you do so without any of the crap that we're talking about? Well, right I have another kind of hack that I I came into, right? Just kind of trial and error with clients. Uh, again, messing with the, the psychology of how, how the human brain works, right? I told you the, the weekend one. Well, another one that I would do when talking about diets, which shook clients up always because you get a lady who comes in and she's got to lose 50 pounds, and you know she's you know ready. She's ready for me to tell her, all right, you can't have this. This is what we're going to follow. Like we're cutting back on this. And I actually would spend no time doing that at all. All I would want to do is kind of get an idea of what she currently is doing. Which would, if it meant she was eating McDonald's and and ice cream and all, whatever, I want to see everything that you're doing. And then instead of telling her she can't have any of those things, I would actually add to her diet. 
I would look for an area, whether it be a lack of good lean protein or healthy fats or not enough greens. And I would look at the diet and not tell her she can't have any of those things that she was eating that I know aren't great for her. And I'd say, listen, this is all I want you to do for now. We are going to have two salads every day yeah. in addition to what you're doing. So don't, don't worry about everything else you're doing. Just make sure you, you add a salad here and you add a salad there. Or, hey, I want you to make sure that you get an extra chicken breast every single day in your diet because we're not getting enough lean protein. Yeah. And I would pick one or two things I know that would improve her eating. And what I knew would happen is she, without even knowing it, would naturally start to weed out some of those things because, and she wasn't focused on, oh, my coach said I can't have pizza or I can't right. have those things anymore. She was just focused on, oh, I want to make sure I get those two things that Adam said I want to get every day. And then what would naturally happen, mm -hmm. she would already start to make these better choices. And again, it's just messing with that yeah. psychology of telling people that they can't do something. Yeah, pr the protein part is a big one, Adam. Um, I would get a lot of clients who just, I mean, they wouldn't, they would eat essential protein, but they wouldn't eat uh, a, a d enough protein to really facilitate lean body mass gains and to help with satiety. And so having people eat adequate protein, sometimes I would just tell people, let's just get, make sure you hit your protein targets. And then very naturally their appetite would drop because it's very satiating. You'd see better lean body mass, better metabolism uh, effects. And the cool thing is now we have studies that support this. We now show that equal calorie diets, higher protein ones tend to outperform. Yeah, actually, I mean, there's a study we reference all the time at NCI, uh, you know, because people are like, well, if we set up their protein and their calories, how do we know what carbs and fats to give them? And obviously there's guidelines, but the studies are, are pretty clear uh, when it comes to body composition, assuming all things are normal. Um, if you've equated your calories properly, if you've accounted or if you've allocated enough dietary protein, it shouldn't matter how much carbs and fats mm -hmm. you take in. So that being said, a lot of people that are just getting into the dietary space or a lot of coaches when you're lost with a client, if you can get them to hit their calories and you can get them to hit their protein and not focus on anything else and you say, hey, you just eat whatever else you want. Yep. These are the two numbers that matter. You will hit your goals. Now, again, that's that's scientific research. I think sometimes empirical data does come into play. And I think that you know things like stress profiles and dietary histories can certainly come into play. But I agree. I think that and I don't mean this to uh, to be sexist in any way, but I think females in general struggle to hit their protein a little yeah. bit more than guys do. Uh, but, you know, I guess a lot of people would be surprised how much guys have a hard time uh, hitting their protein as well. But it's it's very difficult to do. And, you know, when you when you under eat protein and you overeat carbohydrates, we know that's going to signal insulin response. We know high levels of circulating insulin. That's going to lead to a big hunger response. Um, and so now we wonder, well, why are we hungry when we're dieting? Well, you don't have to always be hungry if you're in an appropriate calorie deficit, mm -hmm. uh, if your macros were set up appropriately. Um, but also, you know, we're talking about protein. I mean, I, I think back to like when I very first got into the fitness industry, protein was protein. Well, we're talking lean proteins, yeah. right? high quality proteins. You know, it doesn't mean that every time you sit down to to eat your food, you're eating like salmon or you're certainly not doing things like fried fried proteins, yeah. right? Like fried chicken or, or things like that. Um, thanks mom to, you know, thanks to my mom. Cause the very first time, you know, when I got into fitness at all, she was like, well, chicken tenders are a protein source. <laughs> so I was like, you know, my mom was the, the biggest, uh, enabler in the world, but I love her to death for it. She was just trying to, you know, you guys know my background. I was anorexic. She was just trying to get me to eat. But, um, you know, a lot of people, they, they do though, man, like they'll sit down and, you know, bacon becomes the, the protein source, right? I Mark. made this mistake. I made this mistake as a trainer, you know, Sal talked about the calorie King book. So I was like in my second year of being a trainer when I really started to get into like tracking my food, right? And I was using Calorie King. And up until that point, my choice of fast food was KFC. Yeah. And it was KFC for that reason. I thought, oh, it's a good source of protein, high protein. <laughs> and I just assumed that it actually was probably better for me until yeah. I looked at like the actual macro profile. I'm like, fuck, I'm better off having a Big Mac at McDonald's than having fried well, chicken. Well, dude, dude, how crazy is it? I, I'm pretty sure this is accurate. I, I don't want to get it wrong. So I'm going to go with the caveat that I think this is the truth. But um, when you go to Chipotle, I've been told that the steak is actually leaner than the chicken. I guess they use some dark meat chicken. Oh, uh, so, oh like I, I could I could be wrong on that. Like, don't hold me to it. So Justin, you're right. He's the guy eat, Justin, yeah. is that is that right? Yeah, I think you're right. Right, yeah, like I've the steak chicken, is actually leaner. I think when they had the, the carne asada, dark. it was the leanest. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, and I think a lot of people they underestimate that. They're like, oh, I'll go somewhere and I'll order chicken, mm -hmm. or doing what you did. You know, they eat out, they get their their meals out. Well, let's be honest. You know. 
people don't give a shit about like your your calories or your macros when you're eating out. They want it to taste good. So now there's oils. Now there's calorie. You know, there's there's uh, spices and sauces with mm -hmm. calories. So you know, I, I think you have to be careful. The the protein we got to get adequate protein, but we can't be getting adequate protein with excessive amounts of calories with, either. With so I, I actually friends, see this yeah. on both sides. Well, yeah. since you brought that up, I feel like we should good talk about this protein. too because this was another mistake that um, I'd see clients make, and I made myself, which is so. You go to and I use Chipotle as an example actually when I teach this because I vividly remember uh, going to Chipotle on certain days of the week and for a while there's a trainer I ate there like every day right it was because I could get all this protein and it was quick and easy and uh, when Steve worked on Tuesdays. Uh, my double chicken scoops he was <laughs> looked so different than when Rachel worked on Wednesdays yep. and Thursdays. Yep. And when you go to the website and you look up what the, the breakdown is, I mean, they base it off of this like standard three ounce scoop or whatever. That nobody does. That nobody does. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, I'm getting these and, and you got to understand that's just I'm just talking about the protein, but that happens mm -hmm. with the black beans yeah. and the rice and the guacamole and the everything else that's going in there. And so when you go to these these sites, these things are not heavily policed or regulated not so it's supposed to give you a general idea of what you're getting but you're not factoring in when steve is heavy-handed and mm -hmm. give you an extra Especially no, dude, unless, yeah. unless you're going to a place that's actually franchised where the those bottom line margins matter like, <laughs> yeah, that's right. how you know like when you go to moe's or chipotle moe's is franchised so those owners are policing <laughs> that shit chipotle is corporate and they're like oh, we don't give a fuck yeah. <laughs> right like and then you got to pull the alex hormozy pause double so you go in there and you just ask for single chicken and they you know they kind of they, they over scoop you a little <laughs> And right. you're like, oh, wait, I want it Very double. And then they move. give you another big ass scoop. Because <laughs> yeah. if they give you a half scoop, then you're like, no, no, no. I said double, not one and a half. Yeah. Right. So they got to like load you the fuck up. But that's, that's for my guys trying to get gains, right. so, not lose that's fat. It, man. Another big challenge is just not focusing at all on the behavior piece mm. of nutrition. I love this so one. I'll give you a good example of this, right? So I would work with clients and they would do really well. And, but maybe they had a snack in the, in the, in their cupboard that maybe their kid ate for lunch or whatever, but it was something that was like a trigger food for them. And they're like, it's so hard, Sal. Like the food is in my cupboard. It's there. I get stressed out. I get bored. I keep, you know, eating handfuls of it. I don't have the discipline. I don't have the, you know, I just can't say no to it. And so I would say, okay, look, here's the deal. We're under. This is good because you're aware of a behavior that you have. Yeah. So let's do this instead. Instead, don't have that food in the house, but give yourself permission to eat it. You just have to drive to the grocery store to get it. And it would just create a barrier between them and the food and some space so they could have some awareness between themselves and the impulse. And that's just a simple example of working with your behaviors. Another one would be like, um, you know, I, I, I noticed that when I eat my lunch, I like to be on my phone. And when I'm on my phone and distracted, I eat more than I should. Yeah. So another behavior strategy would be you can eat, just make sure you're not distracted. Don't watch TV. Don't be on your phone. But ignoring the behavior piece, I think is such a big mistake. You know, I think this is my, this is my favorite one, man. I think when, when I wrote the NCI manual, we talked a lot about biofeedback, which effectively is physiology, right? It's, you know, your hunger response, your mood, mm -hmm. your energy, your focus, your sex drive, your sleep, things like that. And I always used to live by the quote that the physical follows the physiology. Um, and so it was like, if we were trying to create physical change, it always came down to physiological, like, like creating physiological change. And physiological change usually came more about your habits and more about like your lifestyle and, and the things that you were doing. And, you know, people would tell me all the time, well, well, I have really crappy sleep. Well, I'm not going to dive into your overall macros about poor sleep, but I do recognize that if you're not sleeping well, it's probably difficult to lose body fat. Mm -hmm. And as a coach, I want to address your sleep first. And so it's like, well, what are you doing before bed? Well, I have my last meal like five minutes before I get into bed. Oh, well, does that make you feel like shit? Yeah. You know, I kind of lay there for an hour and digesting it. And it's like, cool. Can we try that like three hours earlier? And they're like, yeah, we could. They do it. They sleep great for a few nights. Oh my gosh, the scale starts to come down. Boom, they're bought in, right? And so there's all these things that, you know, we've, again, as diet culture, we've, we've allowed people to think that it's only what you eat and it's only the total amount of what you eat and it has nothing to do with anything else. And, and like you said, you know, hey, you can have this food, but your behavior has to go the extra mile to actually get it, mm -hmm. right? You literally didn't change the habit at all. You just inserted the barrier. I think that's great. Um, you know, on the other side of that is I think people put food on an island and, and they remove it from all of the other behaviors in their life. They're like, well, I can still stay a super stressed out you know, person. I can still not sleep. I can still over exercise. I can still do all of the negative things I do as long as I just change my food. Right. And, and I don't think that works in any way. I mean, 
shit, I would rather start somebody if if they're over exercising, if they're under recovering. I would almost say, hey, let's fix those things first before we even address the food because I would I would argue they'll start making better choices by proxy of simply feeling better. You're right. Overtraining, lots of stress, lack of sleep. If you if you think it's difficult to to cut calories and not eat foods that are your trigger foods or foods that you crave, if you think that's hard normally, you add stress, lack of sleep to that, it's exponentially more challenging. You are Your body is literally craving mm. things that you're going to use as, uh, I don't know, as, for lack of a better term, medications, ways to self-medicate yourself. So I'm tired and I'm stressed. I want the food that makes me feel better. You might not be thinking this consciously. This is subconscious. But my brain and my body is like, I want the food that makes me feel good right now. Mm -hmm. I want the serotonin bump. I want the dopamine bump. So it's more challenging to say no to the potato chips. It's more challenging to say no to the pizza because this, by the way, when your inhibitions, quote unquote inhibitions are down, which when you're tired and stressed, they definitely are. If you've ever gone out on a night drinking and then you go get a meal afterwards, you know the food that you choose after mm -hmm. you drink is definitely not the kind of food that you choose when you're sober. And that's kind of similar to what happened. I, 100%. I, I love that you guys are talking about this right now because there's there's kind of two two camps in the science-based community here, right? You, you've got the kind of wellness people that are probably talking, speaking towards the behavior a little bit, and they they tend to demonize uh, cortisol and insulin and, and freak people out. And then you have the other side, like our friends like Lane, that will always be like touting the uh, law of thermodynamics, calories in, calories out. That's all that matters. Right. It doesn't matter if you didn't sleep last night. If you ate the 500 calories under your diet, you'd be fine. So that's all that matters. But you're missing something with that, with that without explaining what you're talking about right now. And I remember when this when this came together for me and it was after many times of fucking up, many times of being on a diet and then all of a sudden like having this crazy like craving of wanting bad food that I was like, man, why would it? And I shouldn't say bad because it's, it, you know, all food is equal, right? It's all just calories, right? But craving foods that were like fast food, like pizza. Like hyper palatable. Things, foods. Yes, hyper palatable foods, right? Things that were going to give me that serotonin dump. And I started to make this connection like, holy shit, anytime I would have like a really long day or stressful or really poor sleep all night long, the next day, mm -hmm. this is where I would fall off the diet. And I started to make this connection. I'm like, oh, this is what everyone's talking about when you talk about cortisol and insulin and that being off and then wanting to crave that. And this is why it flies right in the face of people that always, all they talk about is law of the thermodynamics and it's calories in, calories out, because you're missing the behavior component and how important it is to discuss that because people aren't thinking about that. You know, no one's thinking like as soon as they have a bad night's sleep, they're not like, oh, I better be on the defense today because oh. today I'm going to want fast food and stuff like that. They just fall into the trap. Well, there's there's a whole other behavior component that I think goes into this too. You know, we were talking earlier about how dietary culture has talked about, you know, cheat meals or cheat days. Um, I, I mentioned, uh, you know, the cycle diet that mm -hmm. I did at like one point in my life. And uh, for anybody that's not familiar, you basically live in a, a pretty extreme calorie deficit for six days. And the seventh day, you can literally eat whatever you want. You're actually yeah. instructed to eat as many calories as possible. I think I think my days would start with like Dunkin' Donuts on the way to IHOP. And then I would like wash it down with a Frappuccino. Like yeah. that was my yeah. that was my morning. Um, and, and it sounds great in theory, right? It's like, oh, you're, and I mean, dude, I was ripped to the, I was ripped to the nines. Like yeah. I walked around with like shredded glutes. Like that's, that's <laughs> how, and I mean, it's terrible for hormone profile, but I was lean all the time and I could eat whatever I wanted the seventh day, except it, it also created a food obsession. Totally. And so totally. I stopped measuring food in normal quantities. I stopped measuring hyper palatable foods in normal quantities. And so like back then, if you told me I could have pizza, well, I had to have it on Sunday. And that meant I wasn't having a slice of pizza. I was having a pie of pizza. Yeah. So I don't measure pizza by the by the slice anymore. I measure it by the pie. Yeah. To this day, at 37 years old, if you put pizza in front of me, I have a very difficult time having one slice. Yeah. And so we look at people's behaviors. I don't know what they've been conditioned to growing up. You you might have been in a family that you eat a whole pizza. You you're told clean your fucking plate, right? Like how many of us grew growing up in this generation, yeah. we were told you clean your plate before you get up from oh, the dinner table. Bro, I have another so, one that ex that, yeah, you that is. You're allowed to leave. I've got no, another one so that it highlights this. That it took me years. I was in my 30s when I started to piece this together. Um, so I grew up in a home where there was, I'm the oldest of four, sometimes five, right? When my stepbrother was there, uh, we didn't have a lot of money. Um, and we, my mom would go grocery shopping once a month at the beginning of the month. And she always came home with, maybe there was like one box of Twinkies or one thing of ice cream. And when you're sharing with five kids, yeah. it's first come first serve. 
So I would always, I would never have a regular serving of anything. I would eat as much as I could because yep. I knew that if I didn't, when my other siblings would eat the rest of it before I could ever come back for a second helping. That I, my whole life as a kid, I ate this way. That never ended. As an adult, I still have those, even though- It still I, hits you today. Yeah, even yeah. though I could have five gallons of ice cream yeah. in, in my freezer and I can afford all the ice cream I want, but because I had trained myself that way subconsciously, yep. I still had these behaviors of when I would sit down, I would gorge on something and that was something that was rooted all the way back in childhood. And how many of your clients think this way and don't even realize it? Yeah, those associations are very, very powerful. I mean, uh, I mean, you know, fast food place at McDonald's knows this. They have a kid's play area and fun stuff to do yeah. in there and you create associations. This is why you may have a childhood food that brings you comfort if this has ever happened to you and you introduce it to a friend and they're like, that's gross. And you're like, no, it's not. It's really good. Not realizing it probably is gross, but you have this association with, you know, who knows, you know, Chef Boyardee's, you know, spaghetti or whatever it is because <laughs> you <laughs> ate that when you were sick. As a kid, these are all behavior things that need to be addressed. Um, and, and then to your example about you know not having any food six days a week and then eating whatever you yeah. wanted, that's the equivalent of somebody like I'm not going to have instead of having a glass of wine every night, I'm going to have seven glasses of wine on Saturday. Yep. Yeah. Like you can see the dysfunction there. Clearly horrible. Speaking of which, another mistake I think people make is they don't count the calories that they drink, juice, sodas, alcohol. It's because it's liquid. It doesn't really count. Um, people, I've had people very easily consume a thousand calories in a day worth of drink, worth of things that they don't chew. They just wash down their food with. Yeah. I mean, I spend half my time in, and this isn't to demonize the South, but I spent half my time in South Carolina and there's sweet tea everywhere. Oh, and, yeah. and that's I, real sweet tea. Yeah. Like that's real sweet tea made with a ton of sugar. And I look around and I'm like, you know, and people are ordering, you know, I'll go buy a Chick-fil-A. Someone's got a grilled chicken sandwich, right? They got a fruit cup. And it's like, what are you drinking? Sweet tea. It's like, you're choosing really healthy things, and then you're going to wash it down with about a thousand calories in a cup, <laughs> which is just mind blowing to me. You know, I think that we get so much demonization of alcohol, and I think people are far more aware of alcohol than anything else. Mm. You know, you have an alcoholic beverage, you know, in no way does that align with what you're trying to do. Right. Right. Like, I, I think every dieter knows that. But at the same token, we talk about juice, we talk about Gatorade, we talk about these, these, drinks that are marketed as healthy. We talk about uh, pre-workout drinks that, that sometimes have extra carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. We talk about post-workout protein drinks. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't tell you the number of times when I used to prescribe post-workout carbohydrate, like high molecular weight carbs for uh, high intensity athletics. Right. And they would be like, do I count that towards my carbs? Well, yeah, <laughs> it's fucking calories. Yeah, it's of all, course you count it, it's all right? And it's like, it's it's still a carbohydrate intake. I don't care if it's powder form and, and you know, people are like, oh, I'd rather eat my carbs. And it's like, well, great, you probably should. And for most dieters, you probably should aim yeah. to, but those still matter and we can't omit those. Yeah, and, there, and, and one strategy we, uh, you know, that Adam used to talk about a lot that I think is brilliant is you, you give someone a, a water goal, like drink yeah. a gallon of water a day. Not necessarily because there's magic in drinking a, a gallon of water, but rather... If you're trying to drink a gallon of water, you're not going to be drinking sodas and juices and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, if you're and, drinking carbonated things, you're full, right? Yep. And, and you know, if you're drinking too much coffee, sometimes that shuts off your your desire, your thirst, right? Mm -hmm. Your desire for more water. And so, yeah, you start the day with water, you you stay with water, and it a lot of people that will shut off. I mean, we're talking three, four, five hundred calories a day in yep. some in some cases. Well, it goes back to I mean, all three of the things that I've added to this conversation are the are these things that I've picked up over years of training clients and it's this it's the psychological game that i'm playing with them right you know i've got a i've got a client who is you know has to have their they tell me i can't cut into my wine i have my wine every night okay you know or oh i love my sodas or oh i have my weekend sunday fun day with the girl like they have all these rules they're not going to cut this out they're telling me and i'm like okay it's fine all i want you to do is hit your gallon of water then every day right and what ends up happening is that they're so focused on achieving that that they don't have mm -hmm. time or room to fit those other things in and then before you know yeah. it you've eliminated something out of their diet that you wanted to eliminate other diet without telling them they can't. Yeah, and it. along those lines, you ever want to get a office worker to in increase the amount of steps that they take every day? <laughs> Have them drink a gallon of water a day. And it's, it's, I swear to God. Yeah, you they'll get the up and go to the bathroom. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Their steps will go Works through the like yeah. All right, so now here we're at the point now where I want to really tap into your expertise and experience. Again, for people who don't know, you um, you own, you founded NCI. You yeah. train and coach coaches on how to be effective. And there's going to be people listening to this right now who we just went through six reasons why their it's their diet's failing, it's not working for them. But there may be people listening who are like, I don't do any of those things. Yep. I'm I'm not doing any of those things. It's still not working for me. 
So now I want to hear from you, like what could possibly be going wrong? Yeah, you know, I think this is, Adam, you kind of alluded to it earlier. This is, it's almost becoming a controversial topic because people are saying, you know, law of thermodynamics, law of thermodynamics. if you're in a 500 calorie deficit, you're going to lose weight. And I think to some degree that's true, but I think that, you know, as with all things diet culture, some is good, more is not better. Um, and so metabolic adaptation got really popular in the last decade. Now you got people trying to say, oh, no one's metabolically adapted. Like, no, very clearly adaptive thermogenesis is a thing. Mm -hmm. And I would argue if you're consuming under 18 or 1600 calories and you're not losing weight, there's a good chance you are experiencing some form of metabolic Let me adaptation. pause there for a second. When you talk about metabolic adaptation, what you're talking about is somebody's metabolism changing because of the way that they're eating, doing what way. you told it to do. In other words, <laughs> right. in other words, in this example, preserving energy. You're eating 1,600 calories a day. You were losing weight, and then the way the reason why it stopped working is because your metabolism went from burning 2,000 calories to now burning 1,600 calories. So now the 1,600 calories you're eating isn't a deficit, and so it's, you're not it's losing effectively more. maintenance. That's but right. here's here's the crazy part. That's supposed to happen. Yeah. yeah. Right. I think anybody that's like, oh my god, metabolic adaptations are a bad thing. No, they're very normal. Yeah. As a human being metabolic adaptations are, are great. They're normal. They're supposed to happen, right? You put yourself in a deficit, you're supposed to get hungry. Uh, you put yourself in a deficit, your affinity for NEAT will come down. Over time, you stay in a deficit, your strength will likely come down. That's normal. We expect that. The state of being adapted, right? Decreasing metabolic rate from 2000 mm -hmm. to 1600, like you said, well, that should try to be avoided. And so the question then becomes, how do we actually avoid that? And if you're a dieter that's experiencing uh, issues with it, how do we fix that? And so uh, one of the principles that we introduced with NCI like five years ago was what we call nutritional periodization. And when I sat down, I started looking at high level athletes because that's who I was working with at the time. And I, you know, it was uh, everything from NFL to, you know, any regular sport. And we understand that as a strength coach, you periodize their training, right? So like yeah, you can't what, just work out hard all the time. You right. have to. Well, for instance, like, so we're in the NFL playoffs right now. Do you think those guys are going max effort in the gym Monday no, and Friday? No, no. no like it's all injury prevention. It's all recovery. injury prevention. It's all movement, mobility. It's, mm -hmm. it's movement restoration from how fucked up they were at the game, right? And so now, what are they going to do immediately once the season's over? Are they going to go in and immediately go balls to the wall like the week after the season? No, like they're going to recover, right? So all of their like performance oriented, like playing in the game, now they need some recovery because we know over the course of 18 weeks, 20 weeks, they're taking a lot of bruises, a lot of nicks, a lot of, you know, bumps, whatever it is. And they got to restore all that. Now, until they're back to some level of maintenance or some level of like restoration, do you think that they can make any sort of adaptations to make them better for next year? Mm. Probably not, right? If 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 they leave the playing field and they they feel like complete shit and they're nursing a hamstring injury, they can't go in and try to hit a super heavy back squat to increase their power for next season. So it stands to reason that when we look at those phases, why are we not doing that with our diets, yeah. right? And so what we started to realize, there's actually four very distinct phases that every single person goes through. Um, when we hear the word diet, we think of it as a very binary term. Yes, you're dieting. No, you're not dieting. Uh, I don't disagree with that, but then I would add the question, well, what phase of your diet are you in? Are you actively pursuing goal or your goals? Are you recovering from that active pursuit of goals? Are you in an effort to potentially make your next diet a little bit easier? Or are you preparing for that active pursuit of goals? And so from a you know sport nomenclature, that would be, are you in season, post season, off season or preseason? Mm. And so the problem is most people have had this very binary, I'm either actively in season, I'm pushing really, really hard. And they've done that for months or years on end or they've done what's oftentimes worse, they've yo-yo dieted. Mm. And we all know body fat overshooting, right? Not only like, cause when you body fat overshoot, you don't just make your fat cells larger, you actually increase the number of fat cells yeah. you have in your body. And so now you're fighting an even bigger demon uh, and, and you're making it even harder to lose weight long-term. So I, I believe that probably 80% of people right now, that if they were to go undertake a diet, when we look at them where they're starting in a periodized setting, they should consider the notion that maybe they need to start in the recovery phase, mm. the postseason phase. Um, and we say at NCI, the you know everyone's gonna say, well, how long do I do? How long do I do the postseason? It's to restore homeostatic balance, right? If we restore homeostasis, if your hormone levels are normal, if your uh, biofeedback is normal, if you're able to consume maintenance calories without gaining weight and all things are normal, there's zero reason you shouldn't be able to lose weight. 
The problem is most people that aren't losing weight, if we were to give you maintenance calories right now, I would be willing to, that you gain weight. And if we went through all of your biofeedback and all of your physiology, I'd be willing to bet we could find things that are not normal or not what we would consider at homeostasis. Mm. Therefore, why are we trying to start a diet? That's analogous to a football player great nursing point. injuries and trying to create better performance next year. Yeah, what a great point. And, you know, by the way, there are studies that compare diets head to head the same general caloric deficit for the week or for the month. And the difference is one group undulates their calories or Magical. periodizes, and the other group keeps everything exactly the same every single day. The group that changes things, which is similar to what you're talking about, yep. ends up burning more body fat and keeping more muscle and actually prevents or mitigates that metabolic adaptation that tends to happen with a diet. Yeah. By the way, bodybuilders have known this for decades. Bodybuilders have done this Obviously, they, they, some of the ways that they talk about it, maybe not so great, but they've known this for a long time where they go bulking and cutting and cycling, you know, carbs. And that, that all came from that kind of physique sport from that world because they saw that it worked. We now have the data and the science to show well, that this well, is Adam, how. you used to work with a lot of bikini girls and this was like a, I mean, this was like an epidemic in and of itself. Well, we you, would see girls go to these coaches and these coaches would chase pro cards all year. And what would they do? They'd start at the first show of the year, Junior USAs in March, and they would go Junior USAs, Junior Nationals, USAs, North Americans, Nationals. Diet, 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 and diet. And it's, it's literally... 800 calorie diet from March to fucking November. And then they go back to eating 1800 and they put on 40 pounds and they don't know why. Yeah. And it's like, well, you never had a post season mm -hmm. between diets. And, and by the way, you probably need to put that back on. That's what your body needs to effectively survive right now. And we have to remember, we've all made the statement, you know, we're not put on this earth to walk around at 6% body fat. We're put on this earth to survive, thrive and procreate. So when you give your body food, relative to wherever it's adapted to, which again is a normal thing, it's going to do what it needs to do with that food, not what you well, want it to, to do. To put it differently, food. if you've dieted that hard from March to November, and then you dramatically increase your calories, 800 to 1800, your body is like, I'm going to prepare for the next yeah. eight month period yeah, of the next calories, famine. <laughs> and I'm going to store as much as possible. And then you talked about how we well, actually add By the way, it's a 7,000 calorie surplus for the week, yes. which is pretty significant. Yeah. And you were talking about adding fat cells. You're, this is your body's, literally your body's attempt at being able to, it's it's struggling to capture the, all the extra energy. And so it's improving its ability to capture more energy. So what does this mean? It's harder to get leaner later on. Yep. Back to the physique sports. This is when you would hear bodybuilders, physique competitors, bikini competitors say, I, it's so much harder to get in shape than it was before, or my body just doesn't look sharp like it used to. What's going on? It's because your body's getting better and better at storing body fat. Anyone, You're literally teaching it to do that. Anyone something. that listens to this, you got to remember, you can starve a body one time, mm. right? And so this is where I love to hear people say, oh, well, you know, 800 calorie diets don't work. Well, they do the first time yeah. because you don't have any pre-existing metabolic adaptations. So they work the first time because let's be honest, 800 calories is a deficit. You know, in, in like I said earlier, everyone in diet culture loves to throw around this crazy notion that diets don't work. That's bullshit. Diets do work. If you're in a deficit, you are in a deficit and your body will lose weight. I mean, mm -hmm. we've proven this with McDonald's diets and, and Twinkie diets. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at the end of the day, like, you know, like you said, they're metabolically adapted. They're they're no longer in that deficit. It's just it's not going to work out. And, and now. So so when you, when people are listening to this and they're like, OK, this is kind of challenging, confusing. How do I work with this is where you get the value of working with a coach yep. or a trainer. And, and what a coach will do is walk you through this process and one of the most important things a coach will do is they'll tell you what to expect. And here's what's going to happen over the next three weeks. And this is great because when you're doing this and your coach tells you you're going to feel a little hungry, you're going to have more energy, less energy, you're going to notice just cravings, and then they happen, you're like, okay, I'm ready. I know what's going on. And this is the value of, of a coach. Now, you have, you own one of the, what we consider to be the best certification uh, courses for coaches. How do you coach your trainers and coaches to do this? What does that conversation look like? Yeah, I mean, this is actually, so ironically, when we wrote this certification, um, I asked myself the simple question, how, how can we be different? Because physiology hasn't changed since we were born, you know, mm -hmm. since not in our lifetime, not the lifetimes before us. It's, it's thousands. It hasn't years. evolved that much, right? Mm -hmm. um, our bodies are going to work the same way. And so the science is science. Now I think that we continue to uncover more science. Um, but I think that the real magic is in the way in which you apply it. Uh, you know, if we were having this conversation a decade ago, 10 years ago, none of us would have been sitting here 
like with any real inclination that the majority of dieters should be starting with some sort of recovery phase, mm -hmm. we would have just been talking about right. active dieting. We might have been talking about dieting as a binary term, as a yes or a no thing, whereas today we have that understanding. And so I actually think it's one of the hardest things for new coaches is to feel confident going to their clients and saying, hey, uh, I know gonna, you want to lose 30 pounds, but you're going to have to gain 10 pounds first sometimes to recover. Yeah. Um, I tell a story in level one. I worked with a lady. Um, she came to me and she was eating 800 calories a day and she was training five times a day. And oh, I was gosh. and she wasn't losing weight. And she was I mean, we're talking mid to late 50s. And I was like, I, I had the very difficult conversation. I said, hey, if you want to work together, um, I know you're hiring me to lose weight. You probably won't lose weight for at least a year. And, and you'll probably gain a reasonably significant amount over the course of that year. And, and I told her, I said, I need you to think on it. I need you to sleep on it and make sure you're comfortable with this process. I said, you're welcome to hire whoever you want. But anybody that tells you you're going to lose weight immediately is completely full of shit and you should run the other way. Um, I was really expensive at the time. Like I was $500 a month coach um, and she agreed to work with me. And so for 20 months, it took us to get her back to like a homeostatic balance. Now, a lot of people are like, well, why did you take so long? I believe there's a psychology aspect to reverse dieting as much as there's a physiology aspect to reverse dieting. Um, you know, me being a former anorexic, if I had to reverse diet and I gained 20 pounds of body fat, mm. I'd jump off a cliff. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a psychology aspect that I observe with my clients as well. Um, and so we took 20 months, which means, you know, do the math. She gave me $10,000 to gain something like 12 pounds. Mm -hmm. And and then it took us another year of active of actively dieting to then get her to like her net loss of, of eight pounds. But ever since then, I mean, we've been working together seven plus, almost eight plus years now. Um, and it's sustainable. We, She's not working out five times a day. Every, every year we do a recovery. Every year we do a time where she completely takes a break. Every year we ramp up for her cut because she likes to cut around her birthday. Mm -hmm. And then every year we cut like around her birthday and she achieves a new best every year. And this woman is in her early to, she's like 63, 64 now. Um, and she achieves a new personal best for her every single year. Now, That's awesome. the, the really cool part, man, is she's actually undergone some, you know, she had cancer over this time and she's undergone some serious health issues over this time. And, and she will openly tell you she credits her ability to fight through these things to me getting her healthy, uh, not just her metabolism healthy, but her physically healthy as well. And so, you know, man, like when we teach this to coaches, uh, we teach it as a, a non-negotiable. If your client is not willing to go through with a periodized process, that means you as the coach are actively participating in hurting them, right? If we know this to be the way to create maximal levels, uh, maximal levels of results, you are ethically bound to do it this way. Mm -hmm. And so if your client or your prospective client is not wanting to gotta do it this away. way, you got to walk away. I don't care how much money's on the table. I don't care how much you need that money. That's or, integrity. You know, you have to walk away and you have to say, hey, you know what? Try it your way. More power to you. Lots of people do. I'll be here when you're ready for me, but this is the way we're going to do it. Um, and, you know, I, I really... I like to think we've made a reasonable dent. Obviously, there's a massive problem with obesity and, and issues in our world. But um, I know, obviously, I'm very in tune with our community. We've certified over 6,000 coaches now. And just watching the success stories of people doing it the right way, man, it's super cool. That's why we. That's why you're the only nutritional uh, certification course for coaches that we work with. That's and, why. And I so, appreciate that. So, let me, okay, let me ask you a question. How does, does somebody, is there a way somebody can find an NCI coach? Is there a general way? Actually, there is. Um, there's as, as we're recording today, there's not. Not, but in the, I promise in the next 45 days, we have a full database. We've actually gone through, we have completely databased every coach that has gone through NCI as well as where they're located. So I know that like distance coaching is a big thing now, but I also know some people like to see their coach. Um, and so we are actually going to have a coaching registry on our site. Oh, cool. um, so if you haven't been to our site, it's ncicertifications.com. You can go there. The registry should be updated in the next 45 days. Um, we have a brand new director of education who has actually headed this up for this reason. Um, because a lot of people are looking for That's that credential exciting. now. So yeah, we're pretty yeah. pumped about it. Uh, very Great. cool. Well, hey man, thanks for coming on. It's been a lot of, it's been a lot of fun. Always is when we have you on. The I show. always enjoy coming out, man. I appreciate yeah. you guys having me on. Right yeah, on thank dude. you.